Assalamu alaikum everybody. Um, I'm doing two videos tonight. I wanted to separate the subjects. So, uh, I want to talk a little bit about hadith. Uh, I want to talk about this because I was really kind of rude and obnoxious to my love uh, over this and I um, have a lot of problems with stuff online over this. Okay, so if you are not Muslim or if you're new to Islam, maybe you don't know what a hadith is. A hadith is a uh, written record of something that's said to be, that has been handed down supposedly, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but that supposedly the prophet said or did. So for instance, um, but it's it's not the actions he did, it's the uh, the written down proof, the, the, the transmitted, the transmission through the ages. So uh, a hadith might be uh, five different people saying this is how the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, prayed, and uh, or it might be uh, these. This is the way Prophet Muhammad treated his uh, wives, or this is one of the big disputed ones. Is this is uh, Aisha's age based on uh, what somebody said, and so on and so forth. Okay, so hadiths have some problems. Uh, okay, the two biggest uh, or the most reliable hadiths, first of all, are uh, Bukhari and Muslim, and they're uh, and they're considered the solid hadiths. Uh, and they have a rating system. Um, goes from weak, meaning it, there's problems with the transmission. Okay, there's a chain, right? Uh, it's handed down. Okay, so the prophet supposedly did this thing or said this thing, and this person saw him. And this person told this person, who told this person. And if everybody in the chain is somebody who's known to be very trustworthy, um, and there's no reason to doubt what they say, then the train, chain of transmission continues. So say something... And, and it also, the, the strength of the transmission also depends on who the original person. Like, for instance, if uh, the original person said to have said it is Aisha or Abu Bakr or Ali, of course, it's going to be, you know, or Fatima, or um, it's going to be uh, stronger on there. But then we have the chains of transmissions in between. So Fatima said her father did this. So... Uh, that's the first chain. The first chain sounds reliable. The next chain, um, she told that to such and such person. And that person can vouch, yes, Fatima said this. Okay, and now we're going back 1,400 years, more than 1,400 years, right? So then somebody else says, yes, I can vouch that this person said that. And I forget when the first uh, hadiths were written down, something like 200 years after the Prophet. But basically, so then they started writing these down. So some of these chains of transmission are a little long. Now, if there's a narrator on the chain who's less trustworthy, a hadith is considered weak. Um, if all the people along the way are uh, trust, trustworthy scholars, so on and so forth, it's considered strong. Um, another way the early collectors of hadith would do it is... Peop is um, is that uh, if a hadith didn't make sense, <laughs> it was sometimes assumed that it probably was incorrect uh, if it disagreed with logic. Um, and also, unfortunately, through the times and the different leaders and rulers of the world, which, uh, same as everywhere in the world, you know, absolute power. <laughs> absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? So there was some pretty rotten... Um, caliphates, uh, governments, uh, kingdoms, whatever you want to call them, um, in those years after the, um, after the first four followed, uh, first four leaders of the Muslims followed, uh, the death of the prophet, peace be upon him. Um, so we, we had those four and then, uh, it became a little, there was some corruption there. Anyway, the point being, there's been some governments throughout time, uh, some of them based, you know, more in the Iranian Persian area, some of them uh, in the Arab world, and they're used a lot of hadith to form, for, push their own agenda. Like, of course, if this hadith uh, says something that helps 
uh, your people stay in power, you're going to promote that guy over that Hadith over another one. Okay. So that's a general idea what it is, and you can already see some chinks in the armor based on what I'm saying here. Okay, so that's my problem number one with hadith, is sometimes what was strong or what was weak was determined by a weak or strong men in charge of the government. <laughs> and, some, and, and it is handed down over ways, so no matter how, uh, just like, you know, you play grapevine, uh, no matter how strong it is, uh, it's hard to say for certain, you know, um, if, if, if it really happened. Okay, um, now here's another kicker. Okay, so that's my problem one. Problem two, in, in his lifetime, the Prophet Muhammad uh, forbid anybody from writing down anything he said or did. He forbid the hadiths from being done. Now think about that. Why would he do that? He, he repeatedly kept telling people everything they needed was in the Quran. So why would he do that? Um, to me, the only reason would be because he's afraid people would follow that as law over the Quran, which, surprise, surprise, 1400 years later happens all the time. Um, so, okay, one had these uh, can be unreliable. Even the most reliable transmissions are not reliable and sometimes contradict each other. You can have con uh, so that you can have that problem. You can have the problem that he never wanted his things written down. Now, uh, the prophet was not just the prophet and the messenger of God. You got to remember he was the leader of the people. So sometimes the things the prophet said pertained to then, that time there and now for those people and the things he did. Uh, one common thing I think is a little strange is like, okay, people will use what's called a mizwak instead of a toothbrush because it's what the prophet used. Well, I don't know if in 2018 the prophet would use a mizwak when you can buy a toothbrush that works better and doesn't leave little grains of uh, branch in your teeth. This is a, a branch to brush your teeth. Um, that was what he used because that was what they had. Um, people have this thing, bidda, innovation. Uh, there should be no innovations in Islam. Okay, you would think that would apply to changing the laws, changing Quran, but no. People use it to say you should have to wear an Abaya dress because in, you know, 7th century Arabia they wore uh, that Arabian dress. So you shouldn't be allowed to wear Western dress. You know, by that logic, we also shouldn't be on camera, which that's a whole nother one. Uh, we shouldn't be driving cars. We shouldn't be using computers. So that's almost a crazy thing to say. You can't say because they didn't wear this in 7th century Arabia, I can't wear this. Um, so I find that a stretch. <laughs> uh, I find it a stretch to say, like I said, you should have to use a specific toothbrush. Uh, you should have to eat olives uh, and dates because the prophet said that dates were great. Dates, dates, dates are great. Grapes are wonderful. Dates are wonderful. Uh, they're healthy. Uh, I know it's a, a huge integral part of Muslim tradition to eat dates. But he was in, again, 7th century Arabia. Yeah, dates were a big thing to eat. Of course. That doesn't mean you have to break your fast on Ramadan with dates just because the prophet did. That was the food of that place in that time, of course. So I always think it's so strange um, when some of these customs happen like that. Uh, left hand. Uh, at the time, well, still a lot of Muslims, we, 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 you know, we use the bathroom a bit different. We wash ourselves down there. We don't just use toilet paper. Um, but... The, the thing is, we, we don't have to touch ourselves down there now. So the whole idea was that you don't you use your left hand for cleaning yourself down there and your right hand for eating, touching things. So the left hand was always bad. Um, yeah, we have antibacterial soap now. We're, we're a lot cleaner, I promise you, than 7th century Arabia. Um, so those rules don't necessarily apply. I'm a left-handed person. Uh, you know, God didn't speak to Prophet Muhammad on left hand, right hand. He was following a custom. 
Um, and let me tell you why following a custom of Prophet Muhammad is bad, I believe, just if you're following it just because he did it. For instance, the left hand right thing, the miswat thing, the dates thing. Um, because, because in the Quran, it's repeatedly stated, and basically the whole crux of Islam is that he found his fathers worshiping as their fathers, and people in uh, Mecca, they wouldn't change their ways, not because they believed in these uh, in this polytheism or all these gods. There was people, in fact, that told Muhammad straight out, uh, we believe you, but we're going to follow what our fathers did anyway. Okay, so the problem here is the Quran says that's bad. You do not it's absolutely forbidden in the Quran to do something that makes no sense just because your fathers did it. So how did the people of this book, the followers of this book become people who say it's innovation, bidda, to eat something besides dates to break your fast, to use your left hand, to have a dog in your house. I love my dog. <laughs> um, sanitation is different now. It's not the same. Uh, to dress in Western clothes, uh, modest Western clothes, I'm not saying, you know, dress immodestly, but uh, the point being, it's, to, to me, when the Quran's constantly stating, don't do as your fathers did, because, just because they did it is the wrong reason to follow something, I feel like um, Allah is honestly telling us, don't follow something if it, if you know that it's wrong, or that it's ridiculous, or that it makes no sense. Only follow based on what you know. So, if I'm following based on what I know, it makes no sense to eat certain foods, or eat just with my right hand, or uh, brush my teeth with a mizwak, or wear a bias, just because they did that then. Um, so, that is my Quranic take, take on Hadith, and you saw my take on the ability of people to transmit it, and I just, there's people that follow it over the Quran. It contradicts the Quran often. Now, here's where I, the Hadith does redeem itself, okay? Um, let me tell you something which people don't like to say because I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Sometimes there's subjects that are so touchy with Muslims, with Christians. Um, Hadith is very similar to the Bible, okay? Uh, the, the New Testament, I'm sorry, the Gospel. Okay, the Gospel that was written by Jesus' disciples, right? Because as Muslims, we believe the Gospel was handed down to Jesus, but of course the Gospels as written are uh, what the his apostles, or actually some other people, but writing as his apostles, um, say that Jesus' teachings were, what the message was, what the NGO was. So, it's Hadith. It's what his companions gathered about his life and him. It is exactly Hadith. So, there's good things in the Bible to follow. As a Christian and a Muslim, there's things, you know, there is some good advice in there, right? Be kind to one another. The meek shall inherit the earth. Uh... Oh, so on and so forth. Jesus was a, a, a beautiful person. Of course, his teachings um, are beautiful teachings. Um, and even if we don't have his original, the original gospel as handed down to Jesus, we do have the Hadith of Matthew, Mark, John, and Luke, you know, and Paul to, um, to explain some of it, corrupt as it is. And from that... Um, we have lots of lessons we can learn, so we just have to use our sense. You know, there's things in the Bible, the Old Testament that are really scary uh, that um, we can't logically with sense um, believe God would do. Um, there's a point, I think it's Jeremiah, I'm trying to remember, but basically uh, God supposedly causes a bear to eat all these children because they were making fun of this old man. And, uh, and it's like, what? What? Who decided that that was God that made a berry chill? Like, what kind of lesson is that? This is like a horror story to tell your children to tell them to be nice to people. That's horrible. But anyway, so the point being, 
and sometimes you just have to combine that Bible, right, with common sense because, like, you have Christians that are beautiful, wonderful people who follow the words of uh, Jesus as is accepted, um, you know, as accepted to be, be a man of peace, a man of blah, 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 blah. Um, but then there's people who are Westboro Baptist Church, for example, that are pulling out these things that don't make sense. And it's because these are Hadiths. They're not the Word of God. They're the Word of God as, uh, or the actions of God's prophets as told by his their companions, you know? So the same thing goes for our Hadiths. These are not the words of God. These are not the handed down words of God. These are the w words and the interpretations of the companions, ultimately, to the prophet, uh, who wrote down these things against his wishes. And I believe the prophet Muhammad knew that this would happen. He knew that his words would get... Actually, I, I know he would. <laughs> I know he did, and I know in the Bible it says this. In the Bible, wow. In the Quran, it says that there, this will happen, and uh, in, now I'm going back to the Bible. And in the Bible, it says this will happen for Jesus, right? People twist his words. And um, so this is why I don't believe in Hadith as any sort of law. Um, I won't shun Hadith. I won't be one of these people who are the Quranists who say you can't believe in Hadith because it's a moral code, just like the Christian Bible. It's a moral code. It's not, but it's not the law of God. The law of God as handed down to Moses. The law of God as handed to, you know, Muhammad. The law of God. Um, and I just see so many Muslims who would take Hadith out over the, oh, they would take the Hadith as law over the Quran. Does that make sense? Um, and so, yeah, this is my problem with Hadith. I am glad the Hadith is there. Uh, I wash based on Hadith, my, my wudu, you know, my, my purification. I pray based on the Hadith. I do some things even though I don't even know if I believe in the Hadith because they're just ritual traditions and uh, they're just part of my Muslimness. Um, but do I feel like Hadiths are law? Never, never. I don't even know that there are, you know, they, there's Sunnah. As well, everything's Sunnah. It's Sunnah. It's Sunnah. Sunnah means, uh, Sunnah means that it was uh, as Muhammad did. Okay, so that's another new phrase if you're new to Islam. Um, so it's Sunnah does not mean it's required, and sometimes it means it. It shouldn't be required. You have to use your brain. And I believe the Quran says that you should, I mean, in, it's there. Muhammad felt you should use your brain. The, the, the Quran feels you should use your brain. So, um, yeah, Quran are helpful little moral things, but don't take them to heart. They're not the law. The Quran is the law. <sighs> okay. So, my rant is done. 20 minute long rant. Sorry guys. <laughs> but if that helped any of you clarify on how you feel about this, then um, good for me. <laughs>